So good morning. That's a cue. Uh, my name is David Passmore, and I'm a professor in the College of Education. And I'd like to welcome you today to the 11th Coil Fisher Talk. And uh, it's my privilege to introduce our speaker. And I want to note that on our speaker's Twitter feed, it says that he is a chainsaw aficionado. OK. And I'm going to say right now, that and an interest in deer hides and yingling beer will make you an official Pennsylvania man. <laughs> so you're well on your way. But there's more to it than just uh, chainsaw aficionado. Maybe you'll be able to bring that in to the talk. Anant Agrawal is the CEO of edX an online learning destination founded by Harvard and MIT. And I taught the first edX course on circuits and electronics at MIT, which drew 155,000 students from 162 countries. He served as a director of uh, CSAIL, which is MIT's computer science and artificial intelligence laboratory, and is a professor of electrical engineering and computer science at MIT. He's a well-decorated guy. He's won the Maurice Wilkes Prize for Computer Architecture, MIT's Smullen and Jameson Prizes for Teaching, and he holds a Guinness World Record for the largest microphone array, which is an electrical engineering feat, I think. And he's also the author of a, of a textbook in, uh, in electronic circuits. His work on organic computing was selected by Scientific American as one of the 10 world-changing ideas in 2011. And he was named in Forbes' list of top 15 educators for 2012. Let's give a good cross-cutting Penn State welcome to Anand Agrawal. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I do love. Uh, I do love chainsaws and so on, and uh, if I'd known that uh, uh, it was part of your official state flag or, uh, or, 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 or culture, I would have brought a video. Uh, so, uh, so I believe, I've always believed that, uh, that lecture is theater, and unless you, unless you have an engaged student, uh, they're going to learn squat. And so, uh, so in, in, in the classes that I teach, we have a lot of fun, and one of the things I do in the circuits class is actually uh, my TA and I actually do a chainsaw dance in class. And, it, and it's, it's not just a fun thing. We actually uh, fire up the chainsaw and so on and uh, use that to inject noise into a system and show that how digital systems differ from analog systems in that the digital systems are impervious to noise and we use chainsaws to rub up the chainsaw to show that the system still works. So there is a uh, pedagogical point to the chainsaw hack in, uh, in, in class. So, uh, so chainsaws are a lot of fun, but but today I want to talk about uh, talk about education, and uh, and edX, and uh, uh, what our principles are, and uh, you know what we got to do about it. There we go. So, uh, so before uh, you know talking about edX, I just want to discuss briefly what the world is like uh, out there. <coughs> you know, excuse me, uh, as I go into coughing fits uh, off and on, I've been. Uh, Something from allergies. So what you see here, uh, this is not a rock concert. And uh, this person up here at the end is actually not uh, Miley Cyrus or anybody else. Uh, it's actually a teacher. Uh, this is a classroom in the uh, Obafemi Awolowo University in uh, Nigeria, where a couple of our edX team members uh, actually taught uh, several years ago. And so here, you've all heard about uh, distance education. But if you're way in the back in this classroom, you know, I would call it long distance education. <coughs> so, uh, so we take good quality education for granted on our campuses. But in large parts of the world, uh, things are simply not the same. Um, so access is a really big challenge. And, and increasing access to education is definitely a big part of our goal. So secondly, if you look at our campuses itself, while everything around us has uh, technology has been applied to everything around us and, and changed everything. Uh, so just take, uh, just take uh, communications. So I want you to think back 400 years. Okay, and shout out, what do you think have been the biggest innovations in, in communications in the past 400 years? Telephone, what else? Printing press, 
Uh, but that was 450 years ago, so 400, whatever. The internet, the, the list goes on and on, coding techniques and, uh, and wireless communication, and, you know, and, and you know, this, the, the whole, the, it's, it's an incredible list. Now let me have you think about the same 400 years. Uh, what have been the biggest innovations in education in the same time? You get my drift. Education is so fundamental, and we brought technology into every field known to humankind, whether it's communications, you know, healthcare, heck, even sports. But for some reason, uh, all of us believe that you know, education is such a fundamental part of what we do, and really there haven't been any dramatic innovations. Um, I think the, you know, the, the couple of big innovations, uh, 450 years ago was the printing press and textbooks, that was a big innovation. And then in 1862 was actually chalk and, uh, and blackboards. And let me tell you a quick little story about chalk and blackboards. When blackboards first came out in 1862, professors really were completely opposed to uh, blackboards. They really fought blackboards. Do you know why? Anybody want to take a guess? Why did professors fight blackboards tooth and nail? Couldn't spell? Oh, I, I didn't think of that one. I like that. Oh, they, 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 they did not have auto spell in those days. Yes. Bingo. The problem was right on the chalkboard, they had to turn their back, and, and, and that was the issue. Um, uh, many of your professors here, how many of you have been able to write on the blackboard? Uh, I, I'm actually, I can actually do that. You can actually write by looking at students, so, uh, so we eventually fix that. So, but, but the point is that uh, that was one big innovation that certainly was uh, you know, uh, fought by uh, professors. But, so this is a classroom at uh, this little private university, uh, private land-grant university in the northeast part of the US with three letters in its name. And this was a classroom about uh, 50 years ago. And the amazing thing is, you go, uh, you go to this university today, uh, the classrooms haven't changed. The same classroom, you know, uh, you know, maybe even the same professor, but the same chalkboard. It really, really, nothing much, really nothing much has changed. But the world around us has become completely different. So this is my 14-year-old uh, daughter. And uh, you know, this is how they like to learn best. So I promise you, I was walking by her room uh, you know, a couple months ago. And she was lying there with three screens. Here's one screen, with three screens in front of her. On, on, the, on the laptop screen, she was doing a web assign. A web assign is uh, online homework, uh, physics homework. She's in ninth grade. Uh, she had swiped my uh, mini iPad. And on that, she was uh, watching a Netflix movie. And then she had her smartphone. And she claimed she was WhatsApping with her friends discussing the problem set. And so, 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 so I said to her, I said, you know, uh, I said, this, I really blew it. I said, this is nuts. I mean, how can you do this? You know, you're going to be, you know, your, your mind is going to be mushed, you know, trying to do all these things. She was very patient with me, and, he said, and she said, you know, dad, the only way you know, daughters can, that, you know, you, you know, our generation is different. And she said, we can do it. We can be doing all of these things and learning at the same time. And so this is, this is the new generation. And so, so our challenge is, how do we bring technology into education? How do we... How do we improve the quality of education? How do we cater to a new group of students that, uh, that like multidisciplinary stuff, that like flexibility, that learn very differently? And, uh, and you know, they come into, uh, uh, as freshmen at MIT, and suddenly we put them in uh, big classrooms in, in nice little rows, and, we, and, and then we lecture. They're not used to that. They, they fidget after three minutes. And so it, it's a whole different world out there. So, uh, so, uh, so this relates to edX in that we have a three-part mission. Okay, so, uh, edX is a nonprofit venture. So when we started edX, a uh, nonprofit was absolutely important for us. It had to be a nonprofit. And you know, as we go along, uh, since we, we were founded about two and a half years ago, uh, not a week goes by when we don't make a decision where uh, it, the decision would, would likely have been different had we been a for-profit. The, the lens by which we look at our policies, our decisions, our, 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 our path, our sustainability is really completely, it's, it's, it's very different. And it's not surprising that you know, most universities like yourself in the U.S. are nonprofits, and the few for-profits that are out there, uh, you know, frankly, have ended up giving education a, uh, a, a bad name. So uh, we are a nonprofit. Uh, this is our uh, website. Uh, we have a three-part mission. Uh, the first part of our mission is to expand access to education, uh, where everybody should have uh, access to an education, and that's one part of our mission. A second equally important part of our mission is to improve on-campus education. 
And uh, this is not just lip service. You know, we really, as part of our corporate goals, and uh, maybe have a board, and, a, and, a, and the goals that we set for the exec, for the, uh, exec team and, and for the company, uh, for our organization, uh, are very heavily guided by these goals. So we have corporate goals in each of these categories. So improving campus education is important. And in case you're wondering, how can a nonprofit sitting outside help improve campus education? I'll give you examples of how we work with university partners uh, to, uh, to help do that. Uh, it doesn't help the bottom line in terms of revenue, but uh, that's part of our goals, part of our mission, and so therefore we do that. The third part is to advance research, and I'll talk about that as well, which is uh, we are gathering big data for learning. We capture every mouse click, every answer students give, and, and we have, uh, in some of our classes, you know, we have you know, huge numbers of students. So for example, in the Intro to Computer Science course from David Malin from Harvard X, that course has 275,000 students taking it as we speak. And so we can get huge amounts of data, and researchers are looking at that data, analyzing it to see how students learn uh, to improve uh, education outcomes uh, you know, by, by, by doing so. So really, to, to remember three legs of a stool here, all three are equally important uh, for us at, uh, at X. So uh, let, me, let me address each of these three components uh, in turn. Access, improving campus education, and the research. So the talk is divided into three parts, and I'll talk about all three, uh, all three of these. The first one is, uh, let me start by talking about how are we increasing access to education. So uh, you know, as you heard when we started out, uh, when we launched the first course on edX, it was a circuits and electronics course. Now, for those of you uh, who are from engineering and so on, know that this course, and we were honest about uh, the prerequisites. It needs differential equations. It needs uh, complex analysis. Uh, it needs uh, you know, a matrix algebra. So we were very honest about prerequisites. And we were still stunned when uh, we had 10,000 students sign up uh, in the first hour of announcing the course uh, on, you know, on the web. And uh, we had a total of 155,000 students uh, taking this course. And so the numbers are really, really staggering. And I think this is one of the uh, big things about MOOCs, where, where brand-named universities such as yourselves and others have gotten into it, um, which is really unlike what happened in the past. Um, in the past, somehow, online learning has been around for 30, 40 years. You know, this is, MOOCs are not a new thing. The, the, the technology is not new. They've been around for a long time. Uh, just that the numbers are not as huge. And second, uh, there were a lot of existing universities had not gotten behind it in a big way. And, uh, and so uh, I think these were some of the big changes that uh, really caught people's attention. So we had 155,000 students taking it. And, and we tracked all kinds of statistics. And as an example, uh, uh, 26,000 students out of 150 tried the first problem. So we call them active learners, people that are truly committed to, uh, or at least given indication that they're committed to uh, taking this course. Seriously, so it was uh, about 26,000, which is about uh, uh, a little less than 50% of the students. Um, 7,200 uh, students passed the course. Um, and this was a hard course, which is about 5% of the total population. And I will talk about uh, whether 5% is a good number or not. I, I will address that issue as well. So um, as a teacher, 7,200 passing the course was absolutely fantastic because uh, I teach this course at MIT uh, in spring and fall. And on average, I would have about uh, 100 to 150 students per session. So I would have to teach for 40 years before I pass this many students. And, and frankly, uh, I would pit a student who took this online course. It was a hard course. If they passed this course, I would pit them against an MIT student to pass the same course all day long. There's no really uh, uh, no difference. Uh, we had online labs and, 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 and various kinds of activity that, uh, that really created a very rich and, uh, and full learning experience. To, to, to give you a sense of the, uh, again, we talk about access and, and our mission. To give you a sense of the numbers, the, the numbers are truly staggering. If you look at, uh, so we have, uh, uh, in the past, past two years, we grew to uh, uh, over 2.5 million students from uh, 196 countries, which, by the way, happens to be all the countries in the world. But if you look at IP addresses, we have 129. And in case you're wondering, 196 countries officially, but um, why 229? It turns out that uh, the number of countries that call themselves countries uh, that are not really countries, and then you have uh, 
principalities, and then you have uh, you know the papal states. So we have one from every single uh, any any unit you can think of. We have students from uh, there. Uh, we have about 200 courses on our platform right now um, from our partners in uh, in a large number of languages: uh, English, French, uh, Mandarin, uh, Hindi. Our platform has also been internationalized, and uh, and you can uh, it's uh, you can do Arabic. Uh, you can see Arabic controls, Mandarin. Controls, Hindi controls, and so on. Uh, the way we work is that we partner with uh, uh, education institutions uh, um, and, uh, and other uh, organizations that offer courses on edX. So, for example, some of our partner universities, uh, Harvard and MIT, with the founders. Um, others include uh, uh, Berkeley. Uh, Berkeley uh, uh, the Berkeley Provost is also on our uh, uh, board. Um, we also have other universities like UP Austin, for example. We have uh, Tsinghua in China, IIT Bombay, uh, you know, ETH from uh, Zurich, and so on and so forth. So about 50 institutions. We also have other organizations that serve as our uh, partners. So for example, um, uh, OCC, which is now OEC, the Open Courseware Consortium, is, has become a member as well. Uh, the Smithsonian is a member. Um, and now countries have begun to become members. Mexico just joined as a member, as Mexico X. And I'll talk about sort of the broadening scope of how, how this is working. And you will hear a lot of countries adopting it, uh, adopting open edX, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. I also mentioned that improving campus uh, is a is a equally important part of our mission. And we spend a lot of time uh, working with partners and, and, and ourselves and building technologies in our platform to help that. And so another metric we measure ourselves on is how many campus courses are being taught in a blended model using our platform. And, uh, and data count uh, is, is at least 150. And uh, 15,000 students uh, taking courses on edX within campuses. So uh, as important as 2.5 million learners, it is this number, which is how many campuses are using our platform in the campus offering courses. Uh, and it, and in, the, in the space of six months, this number has gone from 75 to 150, so it's doubled in six months. So we're really excited about that number as well. So, um, so numbers aside, it's actually very interesting to think about uh, individual, uh, uh, you know, individual learners. So I'll just tell you, a, you know, uh, a, a, a quick little story. So, uh, so uh, a one learner in particular, uh, uh, Claude Mukendi, and uh, and students write to us and, and post their stories on Tumblr and so on, and it's absolutely uh, incredible, uh, the kind of people that uh, online education is able to touch. So Claude Mukendi, as one example, was uh, uh, was a, was a was a uh, student from a family of 14 from the Democratic Republic of Congo. So he goes to the University of Cape Town in South Africa from uh, DRC 10 years ago when he was 18 and uh, to study computer science. So his uh, father passes away in his first year, so he can't go to, can't pay his tuition anymore. So he quits uh, UCT and then he takes up a job 10 years ago. And now uh, he's gone back to taking his online courses and he's, and, he, and he's telling us, I'm a continuous learner, I'm able to. Uh, uh, continue on, and, uh, and he, he hopes to learn enough that he can now go back to computer science, get a job as in, in computer science. Um, a number of things that we do is uh, you know, how do learners demonstrate that uh, uh, they have uh, accomplished, uh, done something well in the class. There's three ways you can take an edX course. You can audit the course. So a large number of people, uh, uh, more than 70%, just want to audit. They're really not in there to get a credential, they just want to audit the class. So they can click on the audit button, they just want to audit the course. A second is an honor code certificate, where what they're saying is that, uh, uh, you know, there's no identity verification or anything like that, I still want a certificate. And, and you notice in, in uh, edX certificates, uh, we use the X branding. The certificate comes from uh, uh, the X brand of the university. So, uh, so for example, here it is uh, uh, Berkeley where uh, if a student takes an online course uh, from MIT or Berkeley and they pass the course, they get a certificate from Berkeley X or MIT X. So, so for the student, they get a credential from the university where the university can still distinguish between the campus brand and the uh, online brand for edX using the X uh, marking. So they start to straddle uh, both of these. Uh, we also have uh, verified certificates of achievement where uh, students have to pay a small fee for the service uh, on the order of a textbook, price of a textbook, 50 bucks or thereabouts, where they uh, sign in, uh, 
we take a picture with a webcam, they also show their ID, and uh, we work with the company, Software Secure, that uh, has a way of uh, uh, making sure that they are who they say they are, and they get a verified certificate of, uh, of achievement. Now, one of the interesting questions that uh, comes up, and this goes back to the 5% remark I made, which is, there's been a lot of uh, discussion in the press about, oh, MOOCs don't work, you know, online education doesn't work, uh, you know, only 5-7% seem to pass these courses. So, that, so that's legitimate, uh, the data is, data is correct and fair, so how do we respond to that? And uh, it's actually quite telling, uh, since on edX you can indicate what you're trying to do, uh, the, the, uh, the numbers are as follows. If you are, if you sign up just to audit a course, that's correct, 5% of auditors pass. If you sign up for an honor code certificate, which is also free, 5% pass. However, of the students that pay even 25 bucks or, or, or are serious and sign up for a verified certificate, 60% pass. And 60% and is, in, in case you're wondering, is you know, clearly at Penn State and so on, the numbers are much higher. But uh, across the US, you'll, you'll be surprised. In, uh, in public school, in public universities, 50% is, is more a, a reasonable average number. And in fact, in the US, of all the students who start an education in the university, 68% do not complete. So only a third of the students complete. And, uh, and in case you're wondering, uh, you have your own world campus, and you look at the demographics of students taking courses on your world campus, it's a lot of continuing learners. So a lot of these learners, more than two thirds that drop out of university, they come back and become continuing learners and take online courses because they've got jobs, they've got families, and they, you know, they can't go back to campus. And so 60% uh, so is a pretty decent number. So that is one way of looking at it. Now, we're also looking at ways in which we can improve, uh, we can improve uh, the pass rate for uh, MOOCs as well. So how do we do that? So how do we do better than 60%, better than 5%? So, uh, so we take some guidance from a lot of research that is being done with edX uh, data. So one thing that, uh, uh, any of you know Lori Breslau, a researcher at MIT in education? So some of you nodding yet. So, so, so Lori Breslau, so, so we share all our data for the courses with our partner universities, and she did a bunch of research to look at what correlates with success. You know, what distinguishes a student who succeeded in an online MOOC course versus someone who hasn't succeeded. And one of the single biggest correlators she found to success was that students studied in groups that they worked in pairs, they worked in small groups, or they had a faculty mentor or a friend mentor. It, it, group activity was a single huge correlator to success. And, uh, and, and the second big correlator to success was, was overt engagement by the professor. Where the professor was actively involved in the course and, and made a connection with the students. So for example, uh, uh, Energy 101 was a course from UT Austin, taught by Professor uh, Michael Weber. Uh, he was a good teacher, of course, but um, his course had an unusually high pass rate. And we said, hmm, this is interesting. How come typical courses are, you know, for the honor code certificate holders, about 5 7%, how come this course has a significantly higher pass rate? And as we looked into it, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons was that the professor had a personal Google Hangout with all the students once or twice a week. So he would announce a time and say, I'm going to do a Google Hangout. And he would answer questions, and he would explain difficult concepts, and so on. Uh, and he would also post on the discussion forum, I'm going to have office, open office hours at these times. So he was very personally connected. And uh, so, so there's two, there are probably dozens of ideas we can use, but here are two ideas. So what we've done, we've taken these to heart, and we've brought them back onto the platform and put them into the platform. So as an example, the social connection, the, the, the professor connection with the student, the, you know, the social. So there, what we've done is, uh, uh, Google is one of our open source partners. They integrated Google Hangouts into it. So now, uh, so here, for example, uh, we have a, uh, what we call a uh, community tab on edX. It's a community page, where this is meant to uh, foster community. So here, you see uh, uh, that this is the, uh, I believe this is the uh, embedded systems community, embedded systems course from uh, uh, UT uh, Austin. And so here, uh, you notice uh, we encourage professors to now uh, hold hangout sessions, and we, and we made that part of the platform, made it easy for professors to do that. Notice that um, this professor has had multiple hangouts um, with uh, with students, 
and students can go and look at uh, the recordings of the previous hangouts. And so uh, that this, we found that this correlates with uh, better outcomes. And, and as part of the community page, um, we also automatically tie this page in to what's happening in the social world. Uh, so for example, uh, all the Twitter feeds that relate to uh, the course hashtag or Facebook posts that relate to uh, uh, this community are now fed into the edX platform through the community tab. And so we built interfaces to those. So that is one example. And, uh, and of course, having uh, so the community is one part, and then having encouraging professors to uh, make it easier for them to uh, connect with the students through office hours or uh, hangouts and so on. The other thing we've done uh, there, again, is a lot of students who come and take these courses have no idea what they're getting in for. So, uh, so I'm sure many of you, uh, you know, as you teach courses, um, on, uh, so I teach a course on parallel computing. It's a, it's a grad, advanced undergraduate intro grad class at MIT uh, on parallel computing. And on the first day of class, usually about 80, 90 students show up. And then, you know, when you, uh, you know, by the second week or third week, you know, there's about 40 students in the class, and 35 of them will pass the course. So when I say 35, when people ask me, what percentage pass your course? I don't divide 35 by the people who are shopping, you know, the 80 students. They come, they, they sit in a whole bunch of classes, they figure out what the class is about, and then you're left with about 40. And so uh, the denominator is not how many people shopped for your class, but the denominator is how many people registered for your class seriously and, and began to come to class seriously. So that is one thing. The other thing we do uh, uh, in, a, in a university is you have course evaluation. So uh, where students can look at course evals and see, you know, is this Agrawal character any good? You know, is this course any good? Uh, you know, what's the course look like? Do I have the prerequisites? And, and course evaluations are a really big source of that. So uh, we just launched a partnership with, uh, with uh, uh, Course Talk uh, that uh, and integrated uh, their course evaluation into the student, uh, into the uh, course about page. So when you come to edX and you look at any course about page, uh, you will see student eva evaluations listed there. The students can look at it and see what the course is about before they decide to register for the course. So it's just giving them a lot more information up front so that uh, they can uh, decide if this makes sense for them or not. Now, what this will do, of course, is that this will reduce the number of initial enrollments in the class. Because many students will say, this is not for me. So from a marketing standpoint, as a, you know, this may not be such a good thing. But from a student engagement and outcome point of view, this is simply a good thing. You're not wasting their time. So uh, the other thing we did with edX was, uh, again, with access being our goal and as a nonprofit, we made our platform available as open source. So uh, what this means is that we've taken all our source code and we've, we've uh, given it away. So that uh, we put it in the public domain so anybody can take our code and uh, do whatever they want with it. So as an example, I you noticed know, Stanford here. So Stanford took, when we, uh, they were building their own platform using a non-profit approach. And uh, so they have now partnered with edX. And they launched, uh, if you go to class.stanford.edu, Stanford Online, uh, it's the edX platform, uh, the open edX code that they took. And, uh, and they've got 15, 20 MOOCs uh, on there. And uh, it's, it's open edX. Similarly, uh, Google. Uh, Google was building their own platform for course builder. And they have now partnered with edX. They stopped their own efforts, and they're using open edX. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, the Google courses that they had on the old platform are now running on uh, open, uh, open edX variant that they've created uh, themselves. But what was really exciting was what we noticed was once we made the platform open source, and this is completely mind numbing, it's just completely something we never predicted. We noticed that countries began to create uh, national infrastructures using open edX. The first one was China. So that's, that's uh, Shuetang X up there. And so they took open edX and launched a Chinese national platform. So Chinese education ministry partnered up with uh, Tsinghua and launched Shuetang X. Shuetang stands for uh, uh, school, school X. And the X is a little nod to edX, I guess. And so, uh, so it's a Chinese national platform, and uh, they're offering courses. Uh, and, and in some sense, it's a competitor to edX using open edX. And they're, br they're creating a consortium by bringing in lots of universities from China and Hong Kong and the local region onto their platform, but it's open edX. And so, uh, so uh, that's been a, a big adoption. And what's been exciting about uh, these uh, uh, national adoptions is that 
um, they're actually creating a revenue source for edX and our partner universities. So here's what I mean. So China launches a platform with open edX. It's the same platform as edX. It's identical code. We, we maintain the same code base and we release the same code base. So they've come back to us and said, hey, look, you know, we love that, uh, uh, you know, we, we love the justice course from Michael Sandel, or we love actually China. Probably don't enjoy the justice course, but a uh, but, but, but bad, bad example. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, okay, that's a circuits, uh, an engineering course. And so, in fact, uh, what you see here, uh, this is actually the, up here, that's the logo of my circuits course from MIT. So they license these courses, they translate them into Mandarin, offer it on their local platform, and they pay edX for fee. Uh, they do a ref share with edX, and then we in turn do a ref share with our partner universities. So the ecosystem we've created with the open, national ecosystem we've created with the open source platform has become a, a great, uh, you know, sort of a, uh, a fertile ground for licensing content for our university partners. Um, many countries have done that, so uh, FUN is, stands for France Université Numérique. They launched, uh, the Education Ministry of France launched a national platform using Open edX. Um, similarly, uh, Japan launched uh, Japan MOOC, Taiwan launched uh, Taiwan MOOC, and uh, this is uh, um, EDROC. Uh, so Queen Rania from Jordan uh, and the Queen Rania Foundation launched EDROC, which stands for education. They took Open edX and they launched a Middle East platform. And the beauty is they're all not only launching platforms using national platforms using open edX, but also contributing to the platform. So the EDRAC team, for example, uh, implemented right to left. So Arabic you know, goes right to left. So they implemented right to left on the edX platform, and they gave it back to the open source community. So now we have right to left, and we didn't do much about it. So this has been great. Um, the, the, the World Economic Forum, uh, not just countries, but some, another example. The World Economic Forum uh, uh, partnered with us to launch Forum Academy. The, these are the Davos people. And so, uh, so these kind of national adoptions uh, have been very exciting. And we're talking to an, about a dozen other countries that are looking to create national infrastructures uh, using an open source online, uh, uh, online platform. So our, you know, our belief is that uh, these national, this approach of edX, so our vision is not for edX to become the place to come for learning, but rather to, uh, edX will be a platform. But it's ours is more like a federated model, where we, by giving away a platform, we enable anybody to take it and create their own regional infrastructure. And, and if necessary, compete, you know, just compete directly with edX or partner or whatever people want. And so, uh, so our hope is that, uh, that this will even further accelerate uh, access uh, to learning. So, so next up, uh, so that's about access. Uh, next, let me. Uh, segue and talk about uh, what do we do about campus education? How do we improve education on, uh, on, uh, on our campuses? So before I do that, uh, I just thought I'd show you a few little vignettes of um, what an online class on edX looks like and what aspects of it can improve uh, the quality of education itself. So here, for example, is what a student sees. Uh, uh, this is a, uh, the artificial intelligence class from uh, Berkeley X. So notice uh, the class are listed as with the X brand. So we celebrate the university brand with an X. And so the, the course is, when students take the course, they say I'm taking a Berkeley X course. So, uh, so students can uh, take videos. Um, and what we do is we replace the lecture with, uh, uh, with what we call a learning sequence. So you see a gooey element, the ribbon. Uh, that's a learning sequence. So a learning sequence is a sequence of activity. And uh, typically, it's a sequence of videos interleaved with activities like problem solving, uh, maybe discussions, maybe reading, maybe uh, various, uh, maybe simulations, maybe labs. So, so it's a sequence of activity. And, uh, and uh, so the student kind of walks through that set of activity for a given, uh, for a given week, uh, for example. And, uh, and so this, this concept of learning where you have short videos interleaved with exercises, uh, this fosters a kind of learning called uh, active learning. And, uh, and, and this has been shown, and this is a real landmark paper um, in, in education by Craig and Lockhart, written in 1972, where they demonstrated that uh, their learning and retention is actually better when the students are much more engaged with the content than passively listening to a lecture. And so, uh, and so this, and this, this paper really spawned the whole concept and field of active learning. And so we've captured that model in the very user interface of edX so that uh, you know, as a natural consequence of using our tools, 
the professors will be using the active learning model in creating online online content. And so um, uh, the other the key uh, key thing to observe there is that you know, MOOCs have certainly introduced a lot of hype and so on, but uh, really online learning and, and uh, education research has been happening for 30, 40, 50 years. And in some sense, what MOOCs have done is one apply technology to it and uh, and put to practice what education researchers like Craig and Lockhart have known for 40 years, but also popularize education, popularize the importance of uh, researching and, and, and working in education. So those have been the big uh, aspects of, uh, of MOOCs. So the second thing, so active learning is a big part of what online learning can do. Uh, the second thing that a lot of uh, uh, the kind of technology do, does is enables much more flexible learning for the students. Um, self-paced learning. And self-paced learning is also uh, useful for students. So here's, here's an example, a Khan style video uh, in, in a course. And the beauty is the student can pause the video, they can rewind it, and so on and so forth. And what many students are actually telling us is that uh, they, uh, they play the video at 1.5 times the speed, they mute the professor, and they read the transcript on the right-hand side. So, so different students do it uh, flexibly. Uh, other flexibilities, uh, we see most of the video downloads between 12 and 2 o'clock at night. So most students seem to, seem to be doing uh, the work at that time. And, so, and, and, and the nice thing is giving students flexibility and enabling them to pause and rewind and learn at their own pace, uh, the researchers have known that's a good idea too. So the study by Mayer in 2003 showed that even if you allow students to just hit a pause button, and continue to the next segment at their own pace. Even that will improve uh, learning. And, and, and you know, this was uh, 11 years ago, but, but this fact has been known for, for decades. The, the, so why do we still continue to uh, you know, have a class of uh, you know, 500 students and lecture at a given pace when different people learn at different speeds? I, I remember when I was in IIT Madras uh, as an undergraduate, uh, I would never follow as fast as my colleagues, other students. I would usually lose the professor around the five minute mark. And after that, I was just rapidly sitting there scrambling, taking notes, and, and hopefully I could go back and try to figure things out. And so with this, and as I talk to students, what they're telling us is that, even on campuses, that the number one thing they like about this is that they can hit the pause button, rewind, and say, what the heck was that again? And, and, and they go back and they, and they can look at it. The other very interesting thing on the edX platform is actually this little thing that you see here. So, uh, so the social and discussions is a big part of the course. And so on the edX platform, we built our own discussion forum. Uh, and here, and this was in partnership with Berkeley. Uh, Berkeley contributed this to the open source platform. Uh, the instructor in an authoring a platform called Studio, the instructor can instantiate a discussion forum anywhere, right below a video, right next to a problem, anywhere. So that students can be watching the video. So a student can be watching the video and having a discussion with other students in a contextual manner. So they can say, hey, uh, well, what did the professor say at the second minute mark without having to identify the video? And, and other students that are also watching this video uh, can be part of the discussion. And, and, uh, and when you have very large numbers, uh, this, uh, this works very nicely. And the next aspect of online learning that can improve the quality. And the reason I'm talking about these aspects is that these are ideas that can improve the quality of learning, period. And so if we can bring it back to campus, hopefully we improve our learning on campus as well. Whether it's active learning, self-paced learning. Next one is instant feedback. So with an online platform, you can give instant feedback. So we have a number of graders on the platform. Here I'll show you a little video demo where we grade chemical equations automatically. So we can grade equations, matrix equations, we can grade uh, uh, various kinds of uh, numerics. Uh, we can even grade free form response using a number of techniques like essays and so on. And all the grading is automatic and, and the feedback can be instant to the student. So I'll just show you a quick little, uh, a quick little demo where a student enters, uh, has to enter an equation. So a learner enters an equation. Um, so they can see the equation being rendered as they type it in. Oh, they got it wrong. They can try it again. They can try it, they got it wrong again, try it again, they got it right. And they get a little green uh, check mark. So this brings an element of uh, 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 fun and gamification into it where they get instant feedback. And, and the green check mark has actually become somewhat of a cult symbol at edX, where, where students are telling us that they go to bed at night dreaming of this green check mark. But when's the last time you dreamt about homework? And, and this has become uh, 
uh, the green check mark has become uh, uh, really huge. And, uh, and, uh, and, and studies, again, have shown uh, that instant feedback uh, improves student outcomes. So it's not just fun and gamification, but instant feedback improves learning outcomes. And in fact, uh, it has been very heartening to us um, uh, that the green check mark has now reached meme status on the web. So, we, so, so this, you have seen this character is part of many memes on the web. And, uh, and uh, that awesome moment when you get the green check mark for all your answers on the first attempt. And so, uh, so you, you know as a, an educator, you've arrived when they've begun to meme uh, things that, uh, that you've been associated with. So it's very exciting. So finally, uh, so the instant feedback is the next one. So there's active learning, self-paced learning, instant feedback. And uh, the next one is uh, um, a gamification where one can bring, let me pop that. So uh, the question that I'm asked is, uh, what do you do about labs? How do you, how do you uh, whether if you're doing chemistry, or you have a chemistry lab? If you're doing physics, physics labs. How do you show someone a block sliding down an inclined plane for circuits? How do you build circuits? And so, so we've invested very heavily. Um, so we go well beyond videos and multiple choice. So we have a lot of online virtual labs uh, on our platform. And so here's an example of a virtual lab from the Harvard X Science of Cooking course. So here, uh, uh, you'll see a lab where the, the, the student can, all business simulation, can select a type of meat, can select the uh, thickness, how long to cook it on both sides, and then you'll hear it cook. So if you can increase the volume, amp up the volume, please. And, uh, and then you'll hear it cook. And then the student can then probe around and look at temperature profiles, look at you know, protein state versus you know, um, charcoal versus protein, and so on as the steak. You know, uh, all of that uh, done through simulation. This is one example of what is possible through, uh, through simulation. So uh, let hopefully we can hear the sound. Got the sound? They pick the meat, uh, uh, select the thickness, temperatures. The sounds are not loud enough, uh, but uh, uh, you should have heard a sizzling sound. But anyway, so a student can still probe around and look at various, uh, you know, the states of the. Uh, and this is one example of simulation, and, and uh, it's amazing how much you can do through. Uh, through simulation. So all in all, the, the number of techniques are brought to bear with, with online learning that in many of the, in, in these particular respects, those are simply better than what we do in class today. So that brings us to the natural question, is, which is that if we combine the best of in-person and online, we're going to have a better experience for, for learners. And so, uh, and that's blended learning. And so, uh, so uh, we work with our partners to really use these uh, use all the digital content in the classroom uh, in various ways. You know, the flipped classroom is one way of doing it, and I'll show you some examples of that. There's also peer learning, where you learn from each other. Uh, the discussion forums are a, lot, a, a part of the platform where, uh, as I mentioned earlier, right below a video, you can go discuss things. You also have a global discussion forum where students post questions. And usually what's amazing is that even before a professor can go in and answer a question, it's been answered by some other, uh, some other students. You know, I remember. Uh, when we, when we taught our uh, first course you know, two and a half years ago, um, as I said, we had 155,000 students. And uh, so, uh, so, so a few of us were team teaching this course. And we all said, 7 by 24, we have to be in the discussion forum answering questions. 7 by 24. Uh, how, do we, how are we going to deal with this many students? So, um, so I'm, I'm, I was up at night, one night at 2 o'clock, answering questions. And so the student, uh, uh, you know, from, from the US who popped up with a question, and uh, I began to type the answers. I'm not that fast a typist, and before I could finish typing, a, another learner from Pakistan had popped in with an answer. And it was not quite the right answer, so I went back and deleted my, my attempt, and I began to try to correct the, uh, the answer. So I don't type all that fast, and before I could finish, a student from uh, Colombia had popped in with their uh, improvement. And then I sat back, you know, this epiphany going on for me here. I sat back fascinated. And, and the students began discussing. And, uh, and by 4 AM, they had figured out the right answer. And all I had to do was uh, we have a way of uh, anointing an answer, a blessing an answer as a good answer. A, a, a staff member uh, recommended answer. I, I, I just had to go and say that. That's it. And, so, and, and what students are telling us is that they're learning by teaching. And they're all engaged and they're discussing things. And it's just fascinating. It's great for us because now we don't have to worry about answering all questions. 
and so because 90% uh, are answered by other students. In fact, in the first course that we taught, the median time to a question being answered was 11 minutes. So much so, uh, I was teaching a blended class at MIT using the same content at the same time. And, uh, and, and a reporter got hold of uh, one of the students and, uh, and, uh, and said, did the MOOC course help your campus course in any way? And she responded that, oh, you know, uh, if I had to send an email to Professor Agarwal or any of the TAs, it would take me two or three days to make an appointment. So she said, I would just post the question on the global discussion forum and I would get instant answers. So, uh, so, uh, so it's amazing how students can get uh, you know, very quick responses uh, on the global platform. The question then is that, uh, we're doing a number of experiments bringing these things back to campus and take the learning in the large and applying it to uh, campus education. And so I'll give you a couple of examples. So one of the things we did was uh, we worked with uh, San Jose State University. And so we took uh, the circuits course. We partnered with them. And uh, Professor Castro Gadiri uh, used uh, the circuits course as a new age textbook in, in his San Jose class. So he had uh, 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 like 240 students uh, divided into three sections of 80 each. And one of those three sections with 80 uh, used the blended class. In the blended class, what he did was he had the students go and watch the videos and do the interactive exercises uh, before they came to class. And in class, what he would do is he would be uh, prowling on the discussion forum looking at where students were having trouble. He would spend the first uh, 20 minutes of class explaining some of the difficult concepts. And the remaining 40 minutes, uh, this is a picture from the actual class, he would divide up students into groups of three and have them work together and solve problems in class. And, and in this model, uh, the uh, Traditionally, in this uh, circuits class, which is required of all engineering majors at San Jose State, uh, the fail rate is 41%. So semester upon semester, 40-41% students would fail this course. And uh, in the blended class, the failure rate fell to 9%. And in fact, the failure rate at the two standard campus courses happening simultaneously was still uh, around 40%. So, so this was a big deal. So they've repeated the, uh, the same concept. Uh, uh, three times again in, in spring 13, fall 13, and also happened in spring uh, 14. And the results have uh, only kept improving uh, beyond the 9%, and they're, and they're writing a journal paper based on that study. So now the same kind of a blended class is, is being done all across the entire California State University system in, in, in many of the campuses. So hopefully we'll see some results and papers uh, of this big experiment across uh, a number of campuses uh, in California. We've also worked with community colleges. Um, again, uh, we, we take a nonprofit nature seriously, and so we're working with several community colleges to see whether we can take content where they don't have uh, teachers who can teach various courses. So we worked with uh, uh, Bunker Hill Community College, for example. You see Professor Jamie LaRue in the background. And uh, they really wanted a Python course, uh, Introduction to Computer Science and Python Programming. And they did not have anybody who could create the course. So they took um, a Python course from uh, one of our university partners and, uh, and created a blended model class on their campus and uh, uh, with about 20 students. So this is a picture from the actual class. Again, very, uh, very successful. And so, uh, uh, you know, we asked a number of times, you know, are you going to replace teachers? And, uh, and so, uh, so I, I just tell people who ask me that question to go and talk to professors who are using this content and not to ask me and not to guess, just ask the professors. If you ask Professor Jamie LaRue, what she will say is that, first of all, she will say that, um, she, that by herself, she could not have created an introduction to Python course at Bunker. She could not have done that. And she said, being able to have that course content from another university really enabled her to create the course. That was key. And then she said on being replaced, she said her students would never have passed the course if not for her. The pass rate, uh, the pass rate for a class was... Uh, 18 out of 20 students passed the course. And this was a computer science programming class from MITx. It was the MIT's programming uh, Python course. And so, uh, and 18 passed. And she said uh, uh, they would never have passed the course if not for her uh, and teaching in a blended model uh, in her class. So what was interesting was uh, the synergy here where she will tell you that she could not have done the class without the course from MIT, while her students could not have passed the course if not for her. So you see the very nice little synergy happening here. Uh, and, and I think uh, this kind of model will, uh, will I think, uh, take hold even more. Um, 
So our university, so we work with the university partners. Uh, we have a version of our platform that they all use on campuses. And a huge number of experiments happening as we speak. So there's three kinds of these uh, campus experiments happening. Uh, one is uh, what we call MOOC at another campus, uh, MOOC within your own campus, and MOOC with another campus. So MOOC at another campus is where, let's say you have a MOOC. Uh, so in one example is uh, uh, EPFL has a course on uh, theory and application of lasers, where some other school simply takes that MOOC course and uses it on the campus, unbeknownst to the university. And uh, we have another example where uh, Andover High School has, uh, it's a high school, 15 of their students uh, are taking MOOC courses and, and, they, and, and those uh, courses are being put on their uh, uh, high school transcript. So that's one example of uh, use of this content at another campus. So they call this a Spark. A Spark is a small private online course where a small group, it's not MOOC, it's not massive, it's small. It's private and it's online course. Uh, MOOCs with own campus, uh, so this is, as an example, Wellesley, who's a partner. Uh, they taught a uh, anthropology course, and they use the same course on their own campus to improve uh, campus learning. And, and a lot of examples of this. The uh, University of Queensland, one of the spectacular examples, they taught a course, really intro to psych, uh, called Think 101. And <clears throat> again, they use the content, uh, various kinds of ways of blending uh, the content in the classroom. Another one is MOOC on another campus. So the San Jose example that I gave, where an MIT course was used by San Jose in cooperation with MIT NEDEC, that's MOOC with another campus. So many of those happening. <coughs> These are just some examples, uh, not a complete list. So we work really closely with the universities to facilitate these kinds of interactions. <coughs> Um, at MIT itself, on one campus, uh, they've gone into this in a big way. Uh, 23 blended classes happening with edX content. And today, um, so MITx is a campus version of the platform. Uh, two out of three MIT undergraduates are using the platform on campus in one way, uh, shape, or form. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and so here, and different professors are trying all kinds of new experiments. And, and all of us hear a lot about the flipped class. The flipped class is the tip of the iceberg. It's one of 10,000 experiments. My favorite is the one done by Professor Michael Seema uh, at MIT. The introduction, this is, this is, <laughs> this is crazy. Um, it's a solid state chemistry course taken by all, uh, it's a, it's a freshman chemistry taken by all undergraduates. And uh, it's not a flip class. Um, he actually had lectures. And uh, he had, instead of having, why do we, he said, why, why do we have two big exams? The learning sciences have shown that continuous assessment is better. So why do we have one big midterm and one big final? It doesn't make any sense. He said, I'm going to get rid of exams. He got rid of exams. And instead, what he did was uh, students were continuously assessed through the whole semester, and they had, uh, 25 mini exams, two a week. And each exam consisted of one or two or three little problems. And they just had to continue and go through all, all, all this, uh, you know, um, uh, these, pro these problems and instantly, uh, with instant feedback. And again, uh, the students loved it and, uh, and the results were quite amazing. Um, so at MIT, um, there's, a, there's this fifth week flag where in the fifth week of the semester, if a student is not doing well in the course, you get a flag warning you that you're in danger of failing. So traditionally, uh, between 30 and 50 of these flags go out for about 400 students. Uh, in in uh, uh, the semester in 2013, when this was done, only three of these flags went out. And so he's going to repeat the experiment this fall. And, uh, and this time around, students said, why are you forcing us to come to lecture? We are perfectly comfortable just watching the videos. So this fall, he's even going to make lectures optional and see how that, uh, uh, see how that so, and so this is not a flipped class, but it's uh, different ways of using the content. And, and all kinds of fantastic experiments are happening. And, uh, and I think we're just, just scratching the surface of what is possible on campus in terms of how we, how we improve uh, education on campus. At Berkeley, uh, Armando Fox and uh, many of you may know David Patterson. Uh, David Patterson and Armando Fox uh, did the same thing. They offered a 
software as a service course as a MOOC, and then they use that on campus uh, as well. It was not a flipped class. They gave lectures. However, all the assessments were completely online with instant feedback. All the labs were online and so on. And, and the results were, again, uh, 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 very interesting. Uh, so first of all, the, the, uh, the blended class was started here. OK, so this was not blended. OK, this was blended. Right? And so uh, uh, you could argue enrollments were going up already, but certainly even after blending, enrollments continue to go up. But what was the interesting was, Inter instructor ratings were dropping slightly before. But with the blended class, instructor ratings went up. Not only that, the overall class, but the course rating also went up uh, after the blended class. So, so uh, the students did better, and the ratings went up uh, in, uh, in the Berkeley experiment. This is a Tsinghua in China. So there, um, there used to be a large lecture hall with, uh, with rows of seats and a blackboard in front. So this is the blended class. Um, and so here, they uh, have round tables now, and they, they threw away all the linear benches and the round tables, and they put uh, green boards or blackboards all around, in, uh, you know, all, all around the class. And so now it's much more, uh, you know, as you can see, uh, students work in groups, and the TA kind of walks around and so on. So, so really, some of these experiments are happening in, in campuses uh, uh, with our partners and other institutions all over the world. So finally, let me spend the last few minutes talking about the third part of our mission, which is uh, research. And so here, uh, we're gathering the big data of, of learning. We, we, we capture every mouse click. We capture every answer. Any data we can gather, uh, we gather. And, uh, and uh, we share that with our university partners. And, uh, and we make it easy for them to download the data. And many of our partners are downloading all, the, all their data once a week. We, make it, we try to make it easy for them to do that. I'll show you some very interesting research that is uh, coming out. So, uh, so this, for example, shows over time the total amount of data records that we've gathered. So you, you, you can notice we're ga gathering an exponential amount of uh, data. And to date, we have uh, gathered in the space of two years 3 billion data records. So we have a data set uh, already uh, with 3 billion uh, records. Each record of data represents a student answering a question or or watching a video or something like that. And so, uh, uh, as I said, 3 billion uh, uh, records already. And if each record is, let's say, a kilobyte, we're talking about 3 terabytes of data uh, gathered. And, and, and more, and this is increasing exponentially because uh, our courses have gone from 1 to 6 to 20 to 200 courses right now. And, uh, and so uh, it, it's quite remarkable. So I'll give you one, I'll just show you one snippet of uh, one result. And so this was the research was done by Philip uh, Guo. And he wanted to study the following question. What is the right length of video? L let me ask you the question. So, uh, so, uh, so we have videos. We have, in, in class, we give one-hour lectures. And at MIT, we have one-and-a-half-hour lectures and one-hour lectures. Has, has anyone thought about why one hour? Why one-and-a-half hours? Why? And so, uh, so now we can do a study. So with videos, so we have, uh, we have many, many courses, like the Michael Sandel course from Harvard, with recorded one-hour lectures. And the videos are one-hour long. Uh, there are other uh, courses where the videos are uh, two, three, four minutes. So, so, so different courses have different styles and, and, and uh, different uh, ways of doing videos. So I'm, I'm not going to place any value judgment on whether, it's, whether those are good or not good and so on. I'm simply going to talk about an observed piece of data, which is, so, uh, so anyone want to guess what is the right video length based on student engagement? So if you, so if, uh, you know, uh, what video length, uh, what's the right length of video if you want students to watch it, uh, watch it fully? Eight minutes. Any other guesses? Six minutes. Two to eight. Two minutes. Okay, you, you, you're all in the, you're, you're all in the ballpark. So the right answer is six minutes. So Philip Goa looked at, uh, looked at uh, 5 million video watching sessions. So the, the beauty of MOOCs and, and big data for learning is that in one study over a month, uh, you can definitely demonstrate something using millions of watching sessions. Imagine trying to do that in a classroom with 50 students. It will take you 50 years to gather enough data. Here, with big data, you can do it in one fell swoop. Now, just to be clear, uh, this was across uh, four courses. Uh, no, a number of courses, 5 million watching sessions. 
And, uh, and the Michael Sandel course actually was not part of it. So this was, I think he used my circuits course. He had a number of other math science and computer science courses. Five million watching seconds. So video length on the x-axis, three minutes, six minutes, nine minutes, all the way to, uh, to 40 minutes. And the y-axis was median time spent by a student watching it. Notice the, the peak is at six minutes. And when the video was 40 minutes long, uh, students were watching it for about two minutes. It actually went down. And then we said, wait a second, um, maybe the students are not that engaged. So we said, let's plot the data for students who got a certificate from the course. So serious students, how long were they watching? It turned out that even for the serious, that's a blue curve, it didn't change very much. Uh, so the serious students watch 40 minute videos, uh, maybe uh, the half a minute longer. So, it did, so, uh, so the peak didn't change, whether you were a student who got a certificate or whether you were just a, uh, a browser. So we can now get insights like this in one fell swoop with, uh, with big data from learning. I'll give you another quick example. So homework, is, is uh, doing spending lots of time on homework a good idea? We don't know. So here's some data, this is from the uh, uh, circuits course. And um, so here on the x-axis, this is a research done by uh, uh, Lori Breslau uh, from MIT and Andrew Ho and his team at Harvard. So they took all of this data. And they wanted to study impact of uh, you know, homework on outcomes. So on the x-axis is hours spent on homework. And homework did not count for a whole lot in this course. Very little, 5%. And on the y-axis was total points in the course. Then every data point here is a, a, is a student outcome. Okay, so again, this is big data. And notice, notice the nice positive correlation between more time on homework to better performance in the course. So my son, who's now a sophomore, uh, when he was in high school, he would always say, homework is for nerds. You know, why should you do homework? I would say every professor should show this graph to the students and say, look, I'm not placing any value judgment on homework. It just happens that through big data analysis, we've discovered that those who spend more time on homework got better grades in the course. That's it. They're just, it's data. Your peers, those who spend more time, just did better in the course. And so we, 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 can, we can get things like this. And, uh, and, uh, and in one fell swoop, you can get results that are statistically meaningful. But if you're an education researcher, I mean, could you have done this before? And so now we're getting this big data. And as a nonprofit, we are finding ways to make this data available. So we certainly shared it with uh, all our partners. And, uh, and as we figure out how to de-identify data, we're also making all the data available to, uh, to our partners in de-identified form so they can do this kind of research. So, uh, the other thing we've implemented in our platform is A-B testing. So what you can do now is, as a professor, um, uh, you know, you always wonder, should I do, uh, so for this topic, should I give a vid do a video? Or should I give them a, a, a text reading? Or should two professors get together and do an animation? Or should I do a problem? Uh, I have six different ways of doing something. What's the best way of doing something? We have, we have no idea today. We have absolutely no idea. So what we can do here, we can do A-B testing. So a platform, our authoring platform now supports it. So a professor can very easily run A-B tests. It's actually A, B, C, D, E, and G, or whatever test. So uh, for any given, in the learning sequence, in the learning sequence, for any given unit of work, you can give, you can put in not one thing, but six different things. And the platform will automatically distribute students randomly to those six different things. Okay, so six of the students will watch the video, six, unbeknownst to them, a sixth will watch the text, and so on and so forth. But you'll give them the same assessment at the end. And you'll see how they do. And then you will see, and the, since the numbers are so huge, you can now tell which has worked well with students and which hasn't worked well. You could even, you, you could even do a survey, ask them which would you like. And so uh, with things like this, you can uh, do these A-B tests, and, and professors can now be doing experiments themselves. So every professor, and because the platform now supports it, and authoring of this is easy, uh, each professor you don't have to, you don't need computer scientists or education researchers sitting with you and doing the work for you. You can just quickly cook it up yourself. You can hammer out two videos or hammer out two problems and see how, you know, see how it is yourself. So, so each professor can now become a researcher in education to see what is working and what is not to continually improve their courses. And this, can, and this is good for campus students too because my course continually improves. So if I have a lecture which is, which is, which is, which is terrible, and, and then improve the lecture, but I can't tell which, which was better. Heck, do an A-B test and have introduced both, 
and see which students like more or which uh, where the outcomes are better. Let let the data speak for itself. So A/B testing is now a standard part of the platform and and also of our authoring of edX's authoring platform. So let me so let me pause here, and uh, I'm happy to uh, happy to take questions. Okay. Uh Remember that we have about 30, 35 people at home, so if you have a question, step forward okay, and ask at the microphone, and that way everybody will hear it in the room, and then people at home will be able to hear it. And we'll also get it recorded, so please step up. Arrangements. Was, that wasn't clear. You kind of blew through that pretty quick on the China and the open source and that. So, so that's a big, uh, big topic, and I, you know, uh, do a talk. So, so I'll hit a few things. The open source is the code of our platform. That we've given it away to the world for free. It belongs to edX, but we've given it away to the community. So anybody can take it and do whatever they want with it. The only requirement there is that it's, it's, a, uh, it's an open source, it's a particular open source license. Uh, it's called uh, a GPL, where uh, if, let's say, uh, 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 World Campus decides to take open edX and use it themselves, and their team decides they want to add an improvement to it. They make an improvement. And if they keep it to themselves internally, then that's fine. They don't do anything with it. But if they make an improvement and then offer it to the, anybody outside, uh, in the outside world, then they have to put their improvement back into the community so the whole community can benefit from it. So that's, that's in terms of our platform. In terms of content, our universities produce content um, and offer courses on edX under their own brand. So it's under the, so if PSU did it, it would be under the PSU X. Brand X would be a little nod to uh, edX. Um, the university owns the content uh, totally. It's, it's not edX. The university owns it. And even if edX makes improvements to the, con the content, even the improvements go back to you. You, you own it. And edX will not do anything to the, con the content, licensing, anything without your permission because it belongs to you. So what edX does is that it opens up these opportunities for revenue generation, like licensing courses to Edrask or Shwetan and, and others. And what we do is, we negotiate an agreement with them and come back to you and say, look, here, here are the terms. Um, and, uh, and given that this is a work in progress, universities have a lot of concern. And so we work on the agreement to make sure that people are happy. And uh, in the edX uh, uh, partners, a number of universities have gotten together to form a subcommittee that is discussing what the right ways to license and advising edX and saying, here's how you should be doing it. So, so many of our partners have formed many, many subgroups that are advising edX on how to do these. So it's just, it's just great for us. So in terms of licensing content, when you license a course, um, the, uh, the licensee uh, can translate the course. The translation needs to come back to you. Second, they can't make any changes to the course. They can change start dates and end dates, but they can't change the content. Third, they cannot discriminate between who takes the course. So in the Middle East, for example, you can't say only men get to take this course. No, you, you can't discriminate. So, so, uh, so there's a number of, uh, a number of such things. Uh, I'm not sure I'm fully answering your question, but I could go on and on. There's many nuances. But fundamentally, university owns the content, and within the university, there's another issue, you know, uh, if there's a revenue share, how does that happen within the university? As for edX, uh, that's not edX's purview, that's the university's purview. How do you get your faculty who are driven by scholarship and discipline, doing research, um, getting grants, to invest the time and energy to uh, reinvent their teaching? It's a great question. Um, and uh, I think what has worked. Uh, with the faculty is for many faculty, uh, you know, just put, creating a course and, and putting it out as a MOOC uh, is just not interesting to them. Um, but what works for them is one that this is a, this is a uh, uh, it's a nonprofit endeavor, and, and the real big motivation for them is that they can create online content, you can bring it back to their classroom and improve the classroom teaching. That's important to a lot of faculty. Um, now, if a faculty is just not interested in teaching. Uh, uh, you know, so be it. But, uh, but for faculty who are interested in teaching, um, I think being able to bring uh, content back it can be a, uh, a huge motivator to put in the extraordinary effort it takes to create uh, an online course uh, and a MOOC. Um, the other thing is that oftentimes um, faculty are good at different things. Um, some faculty are great at lecturing, but they hate grading. And they hate the management. Some faculty are perfectly happy doing the operational part, but hate being in front of a big class. The nice thing about online learning is that you can think of once you create the course, um, you can take the content done by somebody. If you hate lecturing, you can get all the videos from someone else, use the videos, and then you can have more personal interaction with the students. 
So it opens up new ways of teaching for each faculty member so that it's not one size fits all. And, and so maybe different faculty can find different ways of um, engaging with students. So I have a question for you from one of our online uh, guests. Vicki is asking, where would she find the uh, research publications for some of the uh, research you've been reporting on? So, uh, so where would you find the publication? So what, uh, given that research is such a big part of our mission, uh, on the edX website, we've got a research and pedagogy page. So uh, I would go to uh, uh, the edX website, uh, uh, and I think under the About page, you'll find the Research and Pedagogy page. And underneath that, you'll list all the research that all the research papers and, and so on, and blogs that are coming out uh, uh, based on the data. As edX becomes larger, there will be a lot of storage requirement uh, ne uh, needed for uh, uh, resources. How do you uh, plan to uh, get the expense for that? So, uh, so storage is only one component of the cost. Uh, there's storage, there's distribution, uh, there's a number of uh, things. So, how does edX support itself? And so, fundamentally, you know, we are a nonprofit, but that doesn't mean uh, you know we have to keep uh, uh, relying on philanthropy for the rest of our lives. You know, five-year mark around five years is when uh, even the most ardent philanthropists get tired pouring money down a black hole. So we do have a plan to, uh, to get to sustainability. We have revenue models in place. And we don't believe that a single revenue model is going to work. Um, the model I talked about earlier was verified certificate where students pay a small fee. We believe that can only be one of a portfolio of revenue models. Course licensing is a big one where we license courses. The second one, um, uh, there are two or three other things we are putting together and coming up with a number of um, approaches, a portfolio of approaches where we offer these to universities where they can try, you know, some will be comfortable with one approach, some will be comfortable with another approach, and that's how we get revenues. And at the end of the day, we want to sustain ourselves and our university partners. So that's what we pay uh, for the storage and the content and all of that stuff. What about the technology that's around uh, the grading of free text responses? So I didn't spend too much time talking about it. Uh, it's a very controversial topic. And so if, if, if I get hit, uh, you know, you're to blame. So, <laughs> so, uh, so, so we are building an experimental platform. And, uh, and uh, we're trying to build the automatic graders for all kinds of things. And, and we do research and, 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 and so on. So one of the, time, one of the kinds of, uh, uh, so we want to go well beyond videos and multiple choice. In fact, uh, <laughs> I remember when we taught the first course on edX of circuits course. Um, I heard people in the audience once tell me, yeah, but the multiple choice is terrible. I said, you're clearly not taking this course. And, uh, and I said, we don't have multiple choice. So in our first course, we did not have multiple choice. Um, but then professors, many of them said, we really want multiple choice. And that's when we put it in. Because multiple choice doesn't work when you give students many, many tries. So giving them many, many trials, multiple choice doesn't work. But then, you know, many professors felt we, we had to have it. So we la introduced it later. But as we keep developing newer and newer, technologies to grade different components, equations, and so on. Essays and paragraph answers or sentence open answers is one thing that you have to grade. And so we built many technologies to do that that are collectively called ORA, Open Response Assessment. And so we just launched ORA 2.0. Um, and there are many ways to um, assess uh, responses that we built. One of them is called AI assessment. Second one is called peer assessment. Third one is called self-assessment. And the fourth one is called instructor assessment. With AI assessment, uh, we use machine learning. And uh, to my knowledge, we are the only, uh, only platform that has uh, a machine learning assessment. And the beauty of this is this is the only way to give instant responses to essays. Uh, with peer grading, there's no instant response. So here, what, what happens is that uh, we use machine learning. Uh, as the essays get submitted by students around the world, if there's 50,000 or 100,000, the professor grades the first 100 essays. That trains a machine learning model based on a rubric. And then after that, uh, the machine learner then grades the remaining, uh, remaining essays. And that's the technology we have. And we open source this technology as well. And so, uh, uh, and, and that, I mean, the, this is truly crown jewel stuff. And people are shocked that we opened it up and, and it's out there. And in fact, the, there are some incredible critics of, uh, of open response assessment. And we told them, uh, don't criticize, improve. And we said, look, here's the code, take it. And in the past, what has happened is that 
companies that have had this kind of stuff, it's been sort of snake oil. I mean, ma making all sorts of claims and, they, and, and it's proprietary. In this case, we said it's experimental, it's public, try it out. And as people have been trying, out, trying it out, even critics uh, have been saying, yeah, it kind of works for this, but not for that. And so people are coming around slowly to this. And, uh, and, and we feel that you know, making it open is, is, is a key way for people to improve it. Uh, many professors have tried it out. Uh, so as an example, there's an article in the Chronicle where Professor Bonovac, who was a philosophy professor at UT Austin, used it for his course. And just read the Chronicle and see what he says about it. So uh, don't ask me. So, so our, our view is this is experimental. You know, we're putting it out there. Try it out. If you don't like it, blast it. If you like it, use it or improve it. So, uh, Could you share your thinking about uh, learning objects that are maybe smaller than courses, uh, and the MOOC opportunity for that, and, lar and or larger than courses, say certificates or degrees, and the audiences like alumni and others that might not be a typical student audience? There's so many exciting things to talk about. We could go on over beers till uh, through the evening. So, uh, so if I forget some of the things, uh, uh, a terrible short term memory. So, uh, so one of them, uh, you know, had to do with uh, the size of courses. Now, so, here, so here's where I, I ask you a question. You know, why is the semester? Is it semesters or quarters at PSU? Semester. So why is the semester the right unit for a course? Why three and a half months? When what's the magic? Well, why three and a half months? Why not one day? Why not one year? Why? Well, it's it's completely uh, you know by happenstance. And so, so with the, so so what we call a course, um, certainly on edX, there's no, uh, you know, we, we don't prescribe anything. And so, uh, when, when we started, most courses were a semester long. Okay, so my own course was uh, 14 weeks because I took my MIT course in 14 weeks. Uh, the introduction to programming course from MIT was 14 weeks. And a, a really interesting thing happened there. So they taught the 14-week course. And that course had two distinct parts to it. At a Python, you, you learn a language, and then you apply the language to uh, uh, interesting problems. And what they found was a huge dropout after the first half of the course. So once students learned the language, they said, I'm done, and, and they went off. So the professors did was they created two courses. They broke the course up into two modules. And they're still called courses, just that it's two smaller courses. They call the modules 600.1x and 6002.1x, into the programming using Python and applications of Python programming. And, uh, and the two modular courses, and students loved it. Enrollments went up. And then, and then students at MIT came to the professor and said, hey, wait a second. Um, I'm going to go take the MOOC because I just want the first part. I'm going to take the campus course. And the professor said, so why are we? Why are we doing this big course on campus? So they, they broke up the campus course into two parts, and now at MIT on the campus, there are two mini courses that students can take one half or the other. And so this is, you can see how influences are coming back on campus, so people measure what they do. And so now, um, there are professors creating courses that are very modular. We even had one course that was a week long, which was on just one topic. And so uh, you, know, you call them modules, call them micro courses, but this is a unit, it's a unit of learning, and so you do that. There are some courses that are a year long. So there's a Greek, there's a course on called China X by Peter Bowl at Harvard. And what he's done is, it's, 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 you can think of it as a year long course, or you can think of it as a course using 12 modules. So each, each module covers a period in, in, in history and is about uh, uh, three, three and a half weeks long. And, and there's 12 such modules. And uh, he auto enrolls students from one module to the next. And so there are many ways, uh, so it's very flexible. And this is also going back to campus and impacting campus. As campus students say, hey, I want that. I, I, want, I just want to learn about this. So that's, uh, so the lengths can vary. Uh, the next thing has to do with, uh, with uh, uh, you know, how alumni can uh, use it. And so, uh, and so there, as you have a platform and we, we are very flexible about use, different people like to do different things. So one thing we did as edX was uh, we launched what is called a white label platform for our partners. If a partner wanted something that is uh, under their own brand, not the edX brand, under their own brand, with their own skinning and, and branding, uh, under certain circumstances, we're happy to do that. So working with Harvard, uh, uh, Harvard launched Alumni X, so which is a portal. It, it's edX inside. We're hosting for it. It's Harvard branded. Uh, it's Alumni X. It's only for the alumni. It's, it's not a MOOC. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's getting massive, but it's not open. So it's MCOC, it's Massive uh, Closed Open Online Course. 
So for Alumni X, where, and they have 25,000 alumni who already signed up for uh, Alumni X. And there they offer courses for the alumni, uh, alumni outreach, discussions among alumni. Uh, they show them, you know, uh, hot things happening on campus, and you, they create, you know, hear some cool things from current courses and, and have ways of alumni to engage. So that's another interesting thing that's happening. And so now many of our other partners have come to us and said, hey, if you like that, can we do, a, can we do Alumni X2? That's another example. Um, uh, so there are many such examples. And so uh, I think that's at least two of your questions. So, uh, uh, OK. Hi. Thanks for your talk. Um, I'm curious about when you said faculty own the content that they create. Can you talk a little bit about um, what if a faculty member doesn't want to teach that course? And what happens when someone else teaches it? Does it go away? Or, or how does that work? So, so I did not say faculty own the content. I said edX does not own the content. I said, I said you, you own the content, where you stands for whatever the university faculty policy is. It's a conversation. So with textbooks, it's very clear. With textbooks, um, universities and faculty give up the rights, and it goes to the publisher. Frankly, I think uh, it was a big mistake. And uh, it's a $10 billion business, and, and the copyright goes to the publisher, not the university, not the faculty. I think with MOOCs, we have a chance, and online learning, we have a chance to do it right. And so in some sense, edX is a publisher, but we say the content doesn't belong to us, it belongs to you. So uh, we use the platform and all of that stuff, and it's your content. And even, even to license it, um, I have to ask your permission as edX before I can give it to somebody else. You have to agree to get it licensed, for example. So, and in terms of offering it on edX, it's completely up to, up, up to the university and fact professor, how, however you do things. And, 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 and within the campus and within the university, it's like any other university course. So I have a certificate course. So uh, my colleague and I put in a huge amount of effort to create the course. But it's an introductory course taken by all freshmen. And, uh, and, and when we created the course, the understanding with the department was, even if we were not able to teach it, someone else had to be able to teach it. And so right from the get-go, you know, it's a team-taught course, and multiple faculty, multiple faculty uh, co-teach it. There are other graduate level courses that are, you know, that are really my course on campus. Uh, and if I don't teach the parallel computing class, no one's going to teach it exactly like how they'll do something else. So really, at, at the end of the day, uh, things are evolving in pretty much how they would evolve on campus. You know, different courses, uh, in multiple faculty are part of it. Multiple faculty somehow have to share it. If one faculty just completely does it themselves, then that faculty. And the university and the faculty are having conversations as to what happens to revenue share. With edX, we do a very substantial revenue share. Uh, you know, we start with a 50-50 rev share. And so uh, and as we have these revenue opportunities through licensing and certificates, you know, there's a real danger that MOOCs can produce some revenue. And so you, 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 a university is having a conversation as to, uh, you know, um, uh, how does revenue share happen? University is investing a lot of money in these. And MOOCs are not free. And faculty investing a lot of effort. So how, how do, I mean, a lot of people don't care about compensation, but people want to cover costs. And so, so those conversations are happening, but edX is not involved in what's happening within the university. And in edX, a number of universities have formed a committee that are discussing this, uh, and so that they can come up with best practices and, and, and share with others uh, how they do things. There's something of a long, lumbering brontosaurus that runs universities and that doesn't like to move fast and change fast and eats only grass. Uh, so, what kind of pushback are people hearing from the kind of the tradition, the process that was higher education to this kind of somewhat creative destruction of that process? So, I think the uh, you know there is certainly some of that uh, in the fallout, but by and large, um, in most of our partner campuses and so on, certainly at MIT when we launched this, it was done very deliberately. And I think, you know, doing things very deliberately with a lot of faculty concentration is critical uh, to avoid, uh, you know, uh, huge fallout. So at MIT, for example, before we launched uh, edX, uh, you know, uh, uh, several colleagues and I spent uh, you know, three to four months, you know, um, having, you know, dozens of meetings with faculty in all departments and discussions and so on as to what works. And really, the, the three-part mission of edX, you know, the access, improve campus education research really came out of all those discussions, which is that faculty felt comfortable doing this and launching edX 
Uh, it had to be non-profit, uh, open source, and, uh, and uh, it's going to improve campus education. And how, how do you argue against that? I mean, it's not, going to, it's not looking to disenfranchise universities. It's looking to make them better. Who can argue against making education better? Who can argue against collecting research and sharing it with everybody? Who can argue against, look, we're going to give away the platform for this? I think a lot of the issues that people had with, heck, you're going to come in and, and destroy universities. No, we're going to make them better. Uh, now, the, now, still, there are some professors in every university that, you know, uh, uh, are totally opposed to it. You can say, oh, you know, uh, everything's going to the dogs. We'll look, look what the world is coming to, and so on and so forth. It'll all be online. But, you know, no matter what you do, no matter what change you make, there will be some people that simply don't like it. But, but by and large, we're finding that with the deliberate process being, you know, at edX, we think we're moving extraordinarily lightning fast, but you won't believe, you know, and working through universities, frankly, is like running through molasses, like you said. And, you know, uh, but it's important. But if you don't do that, you will lose faculty, you will lose students. And that, having that dialogue and the conversation and allowing it to color and influence what you do is very, very important. One comment, and then I think Dave's going to do a wrap up for us. Um, this afternoon at 3 o'clock, Anant has agreed to have an open conversation. So uh, it's in, it'll be in 115 of the 329 building. The 329 building is Innovation Park. When you come to the Penn Stater, you make a left. It's the last building on your right, 329. Anyone's welcome to come to join that. It'll be a uh, a bit like this, but maybe a little bit more conversational. So if you have the opportunity and still have the interest and maybe some questions, feel free to join us. So David? Well, I'd like to thank Anant for uh, for being here. I think that this probably wasn't as lively as a Stephen Colbert uh, <laughs> interview, but uh, we really appreciate uh, you coming to, to speak with us and appreciate the audience here. And I hope we can continue the conversation this afternoon. So let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Thank you.